Game jams can be a lot of fun, but they can also be really stressful. There's a lot to do in a very short amount of time. Wouldn't it be great if there was a guide that maximized your chance of winning a game jam? Well, get ready, because I'm about to walk you step by step through the process that I use in every game jam. I've broken this process down into six distinct phases. The pre-jam, the start of the jam, prototyping, your core development, the polish, and post-jam. Most people tend to neglect the pre-jam phase, but there's actually several things you should be doing before the jam ever starts, and some of these can save you a ton of time and trouble in the long run. First up is finding a team. Okay, so most people do this. It'll get better, I promise. Now, if you're working solo, you can skip this one, of course. Part of the fun of game jams is working with other people. It's an opportunity to explore new roles and see different approaches to game development. Take some time before the jam starts to find the right team and the right team members. And there's three things to note here. First, be sure to check the game jam's rules to make sure there's no restrictions on team size. Second, make sure everybody agrees on the goal for the game jam. If you're looking to win first place, make sure you're working with team members that share that competitiveness. And vice versa, if someone is exploring new skills or just wanting to make connections, make sure you match those expectations. And finally, make sure everyone on the team understands their role and the responsibilities that are going to be expected of them. You do not want to get 80% through the jam and realize you have something essential missing just because somebody didn't understand what was expected of them. Step number two is to set up an empty project ahead of time. Now, I'm actually kind of surprised at how many people don't do this. You don't have to wait until the game jam starts to set up your project inside the game engine. Having it created before the game jam starts is going to help you maximize your time for development. This is especially useful with game jams that have a very short deadline. Step number three is to set up version control. Now, I recommend that everybody uses version control regardless of the project. Again, don't wait until the jam starts to actually set it up. Especially if you're working with a team, make sure everything is set up, everyone has access to what they need, and everyone knows how to use it before the jam starts. Also, be patient with game jammers who may not have had experience with version control systems yet. Step number four is setting up CICD, or Continuous Integration and Continuous Deployment. CICD can save so much time in game jam. If you aren't familiar with it, this is a process that automates the build part of your game engine. Typically, this is done inside something like your version control system, meaning that you can spend that extra time developing rather than waiting. Now, if you've never done this, it can be a real pain to learn, but it's definitely worth it. This has saved me plenty of times from the panic that usually comes at the end of game jams when a build just isn't working. Hi. Oh. That's Ash. Step number five is to set up the itch page ahead of time. A lot of teams wait until the very last minute to set up the game page. And while it really doesn't take long, that is time that you could continue to use for development instead. Try to set it up before the game jam, even if it's just a blank page. And if you did set up CICD in the last step, you can typically go ahead and deploy to itch as well and just automate that entire process. Now we get on to the actual start of the game jam. This is the part that most people already have experience in. And step number six is to get the game jam theme, if there is one. There's not really much to say there. Step number seven is to brainstorm for ideas. And this is actually a step that I feel is very underdone. In my experience, most teams or even solo members only come up with two or three ideas and then just choose the best idea from those. And you tend to kind of see a lot of the same ideas as a result. If you have the time, try to come up with between 20 and 30 different ideas. Yes, I'm serious. It can be mechanics, game ideas, art directions, anything that comes to mind. Just write it down. Explore as many different variations of the theme as you can possibly think. Step number eight is to narrow down all your ideas. At this point, yeah, you should have a list of between 20 and 30 different ideas. And I recommend narrowing them down in three passes. First, just get rid of any you don't want to do. There's no point in working on a project you're just not going to be passionate about. Second, review the judging criteria on the Game Jam page. If there's a particular idea that just wouldn't meet the judging criteria, get rid of it. And finally, 
get rid of anything that you can't realistically make within the deadline. As a general rule, I recommend getting rid of anything that has more than one, maybe two, core mechanics. Small side note, do not get rid of all the ideas you didn't use. Even if you're working on a team, get you a notebook, Google Docs, whatever works for you, and keep track of all those old ideas in some way. Personally, I have this red notebook that I keep at the side of my desk at all times, and any extra game jam ideas go in this book. Step number nine is to finalize your idea. At this point, you'll likely still have a couple different ideas left to choose from. Pick your favorite or put it to a vote with a group. Just don't get stuck at this point. Make a decision as soon as possible. You don't want to lose development time just because you couldn't make a decision. Step number 10 is to plan the overall player experience. And again, I feel like this is a pretty underdone step. What kind of experience do you really want the player to have in the game? Is it meant to be funny, serious, scary? All the decisions surrounding the game that you make in the next couple steps should all come back to what this intended experience should be. And step number 11 is to pick an art style. Think about the visual style that you want to have for your game. Pixel art, vector art, low poly, hyper realistic, it really doesn't matter, but it needs to go back to match your player experience. And likewise, color also helps to establish a certain kind of experience. Dark and unsaturated colors tend to have a little bit more of that scary feel, while bright, vibrant colors tend to convey a little bit more fun and silliness. Get screenshots of a couple other games that you can use as reference points throughout your game development process. And you can also set up a few color palettes to help convey that intended experience. Step number 12 is to plan the game's controls. Controls often get overlooked in game camps, and in many cases, they end up way more complex than necessary. Try to narrow down what the player can do to maybe one or two things, and then make it as simple as possible to do those things. Bonus points if you add support for both keyboard and mouse and controller. Step number 13 is to plan the game's UI. You really don't have to go over the top with this part, but it's really helpful to know what information the player is going to need and roughly where you're going to put it on the screen before you ever start development. Now we move into the prototyping phase. I think a lot of people jump straight into trying to make as much content as possible, and they kind of lose track of the core of the game. So I highly recommend separating them into two distinct parts. And in this first part, we're going to focus on the prototype or just setting up the core loop. So step 14 is to develop a prototype as quickly as possible. And this should be the absolute minimum needed to play the game. Think about Mario. You have the player, you have an end goal, and maybe one enemy. The end goal should progress to the next level, and you can add in the basic death and respawn feature. That's it. Everything else in Mario just builds on that experience. The bricks, coins, mushrooms, Goombas, Koopa, Bowser, Peach, they all just add to it. Think through what this would be for your game. Get that and only that built as quickly as possible. Step number 15 is to get playtesters. This is a step I very rarely see people do, but it can actually make a huge difference. Your players aren't likely to say much when things are going right. But when things go wrong, people have no problem letting you know. Get your prototype in front of players or developers you trust as quickly as possible. And from here on out, you should continuously be getting their feedback. Step 16 is to iterate as necessary. Take the feedback you get from your players, match it to your vision for the game, and start making changes if necessary. At the beginning, only focus on the core mechanic. Only once you have those completely in place should you start worrying about new content or functionality. Step number 17 is to aim to be completely done with your gameplay by at least halfway through the jam. So this isn't so much a step, but a really good piece of advice that I was given early on, and it's really helped me. From here on out, don't add any new content unless it is critical to the game. The entire first half should be focused on getting the prototype and the core loop working. But starting now, the second half should focus solely on polish and making the game look and feel as good as possible. Step number 18 is to add in any placeholder assets you might have. If you don't already have things like graphics and audio in place, drop them in now, even if they're just placeholders. You want to have something in place that can give your players and playtesters an overall idea of what the intended experience is. Step number 19 is to take breaks. 
especially if it's a longer game jam, it's important to give yourself breaks to avoid burnout. Just please make sure you communicate with your team if you do. And speaking of breaks, let's take a small break here. If you're enjoying this guide and it's been helpful so far, I'd appreciate it if you hit that like button and consider subscribing to the channel. My name is Mitchell. I'm a game developer and a game jam enthusiast, and every week I post videos right here on the channel. Tips and tricks like this one, tutorials, behind the scenes of my own development, interviews with other developers, breakdowns from some of my favorite games and mechanics, motivation and inspiration, and a lot more. All right, enough of all that. Back to the list. Step number 20 is to reassess your progress so far. Now that we're halfway through the jam, take a few minutes to look back over what you've done and what still needs to be done. Let's make a plan for the upcoming polish phase. If any of the core mechanics, necessary content, or placeholder assets are missing, focus on those first. Once you've got your plan in place, it's time to move on to the polish phase. And step number 21 is to refine the audio. Audio is often one of the most overlooked parts of game jams. Typically, developers will wait to the last minute to add it, or worse, they won't add it at all. Take the time to find or create music that will match the intended player experience. Then be sure to find sound effects that communicate information to the player and give reinforcement, but also make sure that they're appropriate for whatever the situation is. If you don't have a designated composer or sound designer, don't spend the time chasing perfection. Find the audio that's good enough to convey the intended experience, drop it in, and move on. Step number 22 is to refine the graphics. Tweak the shape of your sprites, add in shading if necessary, drop in your color palette. This is the time to make your visuals match the intended experience. And again, if you don't have a designated artist, don't spend time chasing perfection. Get it good enough to convey the experience and move on. Step 23 is to fix any last minute player feedback issues. If you've been getting feedback from your playtesters, and you should have been, this is the last opportunity to fix any critical pieces. And note my choice of words there, refine. You should not be adding any new content at this point. Just don't do it. Step number 24 is to add in any extra polish elements. With any of the time you have left, add elements that give the game just that extra little bit of juice. Gameplay balancing, particle effects, post-processing, whatever is necessary for your game. Step 25 is to submit the game early. The build process in any game engine takes time. Even if you set up CICD early on, it still needs time to do it on the back end. And sometimes there's problems with the build. Be sure to factor in time for things like this, or you could miss the submission deadline. And some game jams are quite strict on their deadlines. As a general rule, I recommend at least a full two hours. This gives you a chance to identify any issues, fix them, and still gives you plenty of opportunity to make a new build. Plus, it factors in a little extra time, because if you don't, that's when things are going to go wrong. And if you've never submitted to a game jam before, make sure you go to the game jam page and hit submit your project. You'll have to select your game from a list, and some game jams will also have a couple questions that you need to fill out about the project. Leave some extra time so that you can get those answered. Step number 26 is to edit the game jam page. After the game is completely submitted, turn your attention over to the game jam page. This is neglected more often than I would like to see, but it adds a little touch of professionalism that can really help your game stand out. In the description section, add a short blurb about the game itself. I also recommend including a couple different subsections, including controls, how to play, and credits, and feel free to add any other subsections that may be relevant to your game. Finish off the game page by changing the font and the background to match the game's player experience. Fun fact, you can typically still do this after the submission deadline. Prioritize getting the game submitted, then go back and do the game page after the deadline if you need. And with that, you finished the main part of the game jam, and we get to move on to arguably the most fun part, the post jam. Step number 27 is to play the other games and leave feedback. I love seeing what everybody else builds and seeing how we all interpret the theme differently. And this is the time to do it. Make time to play through as many of the entries as you can and really have fun with it. If you manage to submit, you've definitely earned it. As you play through each entry, make notes of what you like and what you don't like. Give feedback to the creator on the entry page. Doing this helps the creator identify and fix problem areas 
And it also helps you understand and learn from other people's mistakes. And that part often gets overlooked. And I do recommend being careful when giving negative feedback. Game development's hard, and a lot of us are still learning. Even if you absolutely do not like an entry, try to find something good to say about it. Then pick the single biggest critique that you have and leave that. Try not to nitpick absolutely everything wrong with the game. Often the creator is just as self-conscious about their creation as we are about our own. One other thing I want to point out here. Don't be the person that begs other people to play your game, but then you never go and play theirs. Playing other games and leaving feedback for them is more likely to get them to do the same for you. Step number 28 is to get the results and hopefully celebrate. I'm not going to lie. I am a really competitive person, and I like to do as good as possible when it comes to game jams. So as soon as the results are posted, I'm typically there checking them out. So check out how you did. And if you followed this guide, hopefully you did pretty darn good. I do recommend being careful when looking at the ranking. You might see 47th place and automatically assume that's pretty bad. But if there's more than a thousand entries, you're actually in the top 5%. I recommend thinking of it as a percentage of the total entries instead. For me personally, I always try to be in at least the top 25%. And as I get more experienced as a game developer, I'm slowly moving that number towards the top 10%. Do whatever's right for you and where you are in your game dev journey. So once you get the results, you're done, right? Actually, no. There's still a few more things that I think get overlooked a lot. Step number 29 is to learn from feedback and mistakes. And maybe share your own experience with others. If you left feedback from others, and again, you should, then there's a good chance that they played your game and left feedback also. Take the time to read through their feedback. Make note of the things that they liked and didn't like, and take that knowledge into future projects. Step number 30 is to create reusability. If you really enjoy game jams, you're going to find yourself making some of the same pieces over and over. And there's really not a point to building each of them multiple times. So take some time after the game jam to see if there's any pieces that you can adjust and make reusable for the future. Add any of these reusable pieces to your own personal toolkit. And if you don't have a toolkit, start one right now. Trust me, it's going to save a ton of time in the future. Step number 31 is to learn from others. Now, we touched on learning from others a moment ago, but this is going to be a little bit different. Take the time to play some of the highest ranking and some of your personal favorite games from the game jam a second time. And don't just play through them. Really look at them as a game designer. There's often some really interesting things that they're doing that you're just not doing yet, and you can learn a lot from it. If any of the other devs have made devlogs, be sure to check those out, learn from them, and help support them. You can learn so much just by watching another creator's process. And if you want bonus points, create your own devlog and share your experience. And finally, step number 32 is to network and make friends. I intentionally saved this step for last. My absolute favorite part of game jams is the friends that you make along the way. There are some tremendously talented and helpful people in this community, and often they are more than happy to answer any questions you might have. I've reached out to other people on numerous occasions, and only one time have I ever been told no. Take the time to reach out to those developers who you respect. You can end up making some amazing new friends. And that's the process that I've developed for game jams over the last couple years. It's not a complicated process but I've found that breaking it down step by step has really helped me improve over time. I've started noticing patterns in myself and other developers of what often gets overlooked and where people focus their attention at certain parts of the process. And I found that by doing this, you can help focus your energy in the right place at the right time. And I hope this guide does exactly that for you and your game jam. Let's get a conversation going on this. Is there anything that I missed? Are there things that you would add to the list? Are there things you would remove from the list? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you did find this helpful, again, I would appreciate it if you hit the like button, consider subscribing to the channel, and let me know your experience with it. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Most people tend to neglect the pre-jam phase. 